Welcome to the Bernard Lee Poker Show as we kick off 2022. But before we do that, we have to revisit 2021. Of course, we had the champ, Karai Aldemir, the 2021 WSOP main event champ on the show, talking about his incredible victory. But this gentleman, it wasn't just one victory. It was an entire series, the World Series of Poker. Two bracelets, four final tables, 11 caches, over a million dollars earned. And more importantly, he's now crowned 2021 WSOP Player of the Year, a banner that will be up there forever. Josh yeah. Aria joins us here on the show. Josh, thanks for joining us here on the Bernard Lee Poker Show and kicking 2022 off for us. I'm really glad to be here. I appreciate you having me and I look forward to telling you about my story or telling you you know, look, just look, happy to be here, man. <laughs> it has what an incredible ride. And it is something that as people have said, I don't, I don't think you feel that this is a disparaging comment. You were not among the favorites going into 2021 to win player of the year. No, it's, I, I, I you know, it's weird is today. Like I found out today, I only played 34 tournaments, wow. you know, people, People talk like I saw some things on Twitter about, oh, yeah, it, it's easy to win player of the year when you play 80. Well, I played 34 tournaments and I played more than I usually do. Like, right. this is me pushing myself at the end, you know, running between tournaments on breaks because I'm trying to run up a stack. So, um, no, I, as a competitor and somebody that loves the grind, um, I, always would go into the world series saying man it'd be cool to win player of the year or, or to make a run for it but as the, the as the series goes on it kind of slips away and you don't think about it but for me this year it was very different you know i i had uh, one really sick week or two week span where i decided yeah you know what i am going to give it a run and uh i'm Glad I did because yeah, they all of poker eternity gets to look at my ugly mug up and <laughs> after forever. Yeah, I mean it was a it's a perfect year. We'll get into it obviously a little bit more in detail, but it was a perfect year too because in a normal two thousand normal World Series, you're leading. You're not winning it now because now you got to head over to Europe or Asia yeah. and continue yeah. going forward. So, I yeah. mean, this is a really good scenario. Because, and also, it would be all no limit primarily. You know, there, you know, you, and obviously you are much better and, and much stronger at mixed games, especially Omaha, as, as you have won three of your bracelets in Omaha. So now you're going over to Europe to play 12 events and busting your tail. And all of these guys, I mean, literally one all the way down probably to 20 have a shot to overtake you. And a lot of these guys are no limit hold'em specialists. Yeah. Not me. You know, I'm not yeah, a no yeah. specialist. Yeah. So, I mean, it was, it's a perfect year and obviously, you know, great, uh, great story to talk about, but before we get into all of that, you, you are a, a person that I know. I know, I know that some people see your name. Oh, who is he? Oh, different person, like a Rob Campbell or something like that. I, I'm of the 2003, 2004 moneymaker back then. I know who you are. I've known you. We, you and I have played at the same tables, et cetera. Just to give everyone a reference, the thing that you're probably most known for, for people who have been watching poker for the last 20 years, is your third place finish in the 2004 World Series main event back at Binion's, Greg Raymer, David Williams, and yourself. That was probably the one that you're most known for. But yeah. also, let's put into perspective other people is that he was a bracelet winner before that. In 1999, you won a Limit Hold'em bracelet. Right. And then in 2005, you won an Omaha bracelet. You were a two-time bracelet winner by 2005. 2004, you win the World Series main event. Uh, you finished third in the World Series main event. I mean, you're riding high. It must have seemed easy. Yeah. Um, I... I, I don't know. It, it, it definitely felt easy because I had been playing poker since the mid nineties and 
this whole influx of new money came into poker after Chris. And yeah, I mean, I, it felt easy. I felt like I was going to be so rich. Like I, I had private planes in mind and I mean, it was, I really thought that there was nothing stopping me. Um, and then just like everything, you can't always, you know, run pure. It's, right. uh, it, 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 it goes up and down. Um, my career has, it's, it's been pretty steady. Like one of the funny things that we joke about is when I won my bracelet, the first bracelet this year, the headline is 16 year drought is over. Right. And it's like, you know, I've racked up some pretty good stats over the last 16 years. I haven't won a bracelet, but I've held my own. I mean, yes, it, it was true. I hadn't won a bracelet since 2005, but um, yeah, it was, I, I was one thing for me in life. I am a true believer that it's timing is everything. Yeah. And um you 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 have to be good enough to put yourself in a lucky situation and let timing play its role right. Right. and and that's just what i've done in my life um i was very lucky that poker boomed uh at you know it's it's at a crossroad you know four or five years into my career where i'm listening to my dad every day tell me when are you going to get a job when are you going to get a job <laughs> yeah and and finally i make a big score and i could be like look dad i don't need a job um but yeah i timing in my life has been great and luckily i i had a little bit of experience under my belt and you know, one of the, we were talking about the things that you know that you do good. And one of the things that I've always done good in my career is play bad players. Mm -hmm. So in that 2004, 2005 era, there's so many inexperienced players. Right. And that's just what I've always been able to do is just beat up on the sucker. And, right. and uh, it, you know, it's, it, and then, you know, as the sucker goes away, then my stats start going down in the late, 2010s and stuff right right but uh but yeah it's um it's been good it's been a it's good kind of like you found the fish at the table and you're gonna basically hook them in and, and go from there and, and then also the big thing was is that in 2003 2004 2005 2006 you know, we talk about now the internet players are the top are the solid players back then they were the fish. I mean, everyone, Oh, sure. you play on the internet. Oh, oh yeah. okay. Yeah, yeah. And so like, you know, th that's who you went after. Cause they basically didn't know how to play. Obviously that has changed over time, For but sure. I'd also love to hear, Hey, how'd you get started in poker? Um, it, I've been gambling since I was just a kid. Like I've always liked to gamble. I, I started gambling, playing pool around 12 years old. Um, that kind of graduated to when the pool hall would close, we would play poker. And that was my first introduction to poker, um, was when the pool hall closed. And I just, it, it was really interesting to me how loose people were gambling at poker, the same people that were extremely tight on the pool gambling side. Um, so I, I kind of moved away from the, the pool hall poker to finding some underground games. And then eventually like at 19, I was driving to Biloxi, Mississippi, every time I had a thousand dollars in my pocket and using my brother's fake ID and sneaking past security. Um, it was, uh, that, that was that time frame about 19 to 24, was uh, was constantly me beating the games in Atlanta, driving down to Biloxi, losing it, coming home, dealing, like dealing in the poker games, building my back bankroll back up, then going back and, you know, just rinse and repeat over and over. And um, I, I just think that that was the experience that I needed to – just teach me in the way that I learn best, just trial and error. Um, and yeah, that's uh, eventually 
Um, I stopped going broke uh, the stupid ways because I, I just I, I always said that it's OK to go broke, but it's not OK to stay broke and don't go broke the same way twice. Mm. So eventually, eventually it's like, mm. oh, I screwed up. Well, I don't do that again. Right. And um, yes. so then in I guess my last job was in 98 and made my way to the World Series in 99 and uh, made that score and kind of gave myself a name, so to say. So if I ever got broke, I would always be able to get backed. And, uh, and then eventually in 2004, uh, when I came in third, I had enough money to where I never went broke again. Right, right. Now, the games that you were playing in the 90s, were they mixed games? Was it limit hold'em? Because no limit hold'em really wasn't there. When I was no, playing in the we, 90s, yeah. I played stud on the East Coast. I, yeah, I would play seven-card stud. Yeah, we never played any um, – Never, no, nobody played no limit. It yeah. just it – was, it was limit hold'em. It was uh, Omaha eight or better limit. And then in the early 2000s, no, around 98, 99, there was this game called Pot Limit Omaha. And um, whenever I would go down to Bluxy, the big game was Pot Limit Omaha. Like right, there right. was, you know, Herschel from Houston and Tommy Grimes and Adib. You know, they're over there playing uh, Pot Limit Omaha and the pots had... 20 40 a hundred thousand in it and it's like i wanted a piece of that like i want <laughs> I, that is a fun sweat so yeah. so we started playing that around uh, around atlanta and it just fit me perfectly like it was i got to be really sticky like because one of the things that i was always good at was being sticky and in pot limit omaha uh, it's about being sticky until you can really make the big bet. And so I was always able to pick my opponents in a certain way to where I'm playing pots against who I want to play pots against. And I'm making big pots against the right people and keeping it small against the right people. And um, so, yeah, I just, I got lucky that, that people were interested in, um, the fact that in Pot Limit Omaha, you can play more hands. Yep. It's it's just right to play more hands and instead of, you know, you play too many hands playing No Limit Hold'em and you're just screwed. Right. But in Pot Limit Omaha, where where the, um, I can't think of the nerd term, or not the nerd term, the smart term, uh, equities run real close Yeah. in, in Pot Limit Omaha. Well, I, I kind of figured that out early. I didn't have the fancy term for it. But um, so I, I and and coming from a gambling background, I don't mind gambling. Like I, I yeah. I'm okay if I get a bunch of money in with fifty one percent. I'm okay with it. Right. Um, where and that's and that's Omaha. Like I remember yeah. there was a hand yeah. that that was shown on ESPN, and you know the, the hands if you looked at them were so opposite, like completely yeah. different. The flop comes out, they end up getting it all in. And it's all in, and one person is only a sixty percent favorite to the other yeah. person. Whereas a no limit hold'em, that never happens. And Norman Chad goes, and that's Omaha, and and, <laughs> and you know that's you know what I mean? like, and that's where and and the funny thing is that's where you and I differ because for me, when I'm playing no limit hold'em, when I get it all in, I mean, of course, there's a time where I'm bluffing or whatever, but the majority of the time, I'm a seventy percent at least favorite. Right. Not, I don't like 60% favorite. That ner that makes me nervous. So yeah, for me, right. I'm a set. That's why Omaha makes me get so much Ajana because every time you go in, you're like, I thought I was a huge favorite <laughs> and I'm barely a favorite. Now. Yeah, it's, yeah. It's like, I mean, just uh, in, in Omaha, just your top, top hands against your 20%, uh, you know, near the bottom of your playable range. I mean, it's just like, yeah, like you said, it's like this beautiful hand is only like a one is like 60 percent. And right. and I like it because it's like it makes you it makes you do different things rather than just try to get all in. 
Right. And um, that's, you know, I've, I've just always played deep stack poker really well, just because my main thing is I enjoy being sticky and I enjoy high stress decisions. And when you're playing deep, it's, you know, you're, you're making your opponent uh, make a tough decision. And I've just always liked that. Tell my so, listeners what you mean exactly by sticky so that they know. Um, well, when I mean sticky, I mean like I, I'm in a lot of pots. I'm, I'm voluntarily putting a lot of money in pots. I'm calling raises where I know my hand isn't that good, but I know that um, at some point in the hand, based on different board textures, I'm going to be able to make you make a hard decision. And so just by sticky, I mean, I'm in a lot of hands. I'm that loose aggro guy that right. I think, I think the term is like lag or something. Yeah. Yeah. Know. yeah. <laughs> loose aggressive. So, yeah, I, I remember all the, the cool things. <laughs> so obviously um, you, you get that huge win in 99 for limit. It's your first Hendon mob, put, you know, Mark, was it really literally your first cash? Um, no, um, there was I, I, one, there was one other tournament I had played. So there was, uh, a tournament in Philadelphia, Mississippi. They had one stop. It was, uh, a thousand dollar entry, no limit hold'em. And I satellited in for like a hundred bucks. It was, a, yeah. so I won a one table satellite for a hundred bucks. And I finished like eighth or ninth or something. I still have the plaques somewhere, but like oh, nice. they gave you plaques for final tables. Um, but that was my first event. Uh, then at the World Series, I went out there. I think my bankroll was like 10,000. And <laughs> I, I get to the horseshoe and it's just like so surreal. You see the, the Hall of Fame on the side over the pictures of all the people in the Hall right. of Fame. And it's this right. dark, dingy place, and it's just like poker heaven. Because <laughs> I, come, I come from the pool room, and it's just like this is my kind of place. It's dirty. Right. There's this Jewish deli like ten feet behind you. Right, right. And um, and I see playing twenty forty hold'em. I see Mike Matisau, Scotty Wynn, and like one other picture, one other name of a guy that I've recognized from poker. And I get on this list and I wait two hours and I buy in and like 30 minutes in, I'm 2000 loser. And I only brought like literally I brought my whole life to the World Series and it's ten thousand dollars. Right. Um, so I lose two thousand and have to quit because I'm supposed to be at the World Series for like three weeks and uh, play a tournament one day, the first day for like a thousand and get knocked out and. I was just like, screw it. I know how to play limit hold'em. That's my game. So I buy in and ended up being the so with like eight thousand to my name, I put three thousand into this limit hold'em tournament and ended up winning it. And uh, ended up, yeah, it was uh, I, after that. Like I was on the sickest heater after that. I was playing Omaha. I was playing four and eight hundred Omaha high low. I'd never played higher than like twenty forty in my whole life. <laughs> and uh, I'm just crushing. And then I remember going to the Bellagio and playing 8160 Hold'em for like 70 hours. And it was uh, it was a it was one hell of a first trip to the World Series. Trial by fire, obviously. Yeah. And yeah, that's yeah. what I've always done. I've never like in all my in all my pool playing days, I never practiced. Practice would be playing somebody. Right. And uh, I just I need the adrenaline of being of competing to to see what my cap see what my ability is and uh it's still like that to this day i feel like when there's a lot of adrenaline i feel like i play better and it's the same as golf i can't play golf if we went and played golf for fun i might shoot 100 but right. you know and then we start gambling some and people like would think that i hustle them because you know, we're playing for 20 bucks and I suck. And then I press and press and I play better. And they're like, oh, you're an asshole. You're hustling. And I just try to explain that, no, it's got nothing to do with hustling. But like my skill and interest level is much higher when we're playing for more money. 
Right, and it's right. Been the same in poker and been the same in pool. Well, and, and as you said, you know, trial by fire. That that bracelet win in '99. You know, this is over 20 years later. Look at the names: David Chu, Men the Master, Annie Duke, her brother Howard, John Juwanda, Umberto Brennis. These are the people who cashed and made the final table as event. I mean, obviously, it's trial by fire because you're playing with these players to win this bracelet and i'm sure at the time they're like who is this young buck like who is this kid? he was like that kid like i look back and that was a cocky little son of a bitch that thought <laughs> he, yeah like i i didn't give a shit who i was playing like it right. was i was gonna win and i'm really good and that's you know and that's that you know you still see that you still see that the young kid coming up that is beat up on all the hometowns and they're coming to the big leagues and, and I see it. I, I remember it specifically a kid that I played with this year, but it's like, I saw so much of me and him and uh, it, it's pretty cool to see. Cause I was, I was beyond confident, you know, it's like there's confident and then there's cocky and, and yeah, that, that was definitely me. Back then. And then there was you. Because it's like, I had I had no responsibility. I had right. I had no kids. I had if I went broke, it didn't matter. I could go I could go home. I could deal and make about five hundred bucks a week. And in two weeks, I'd be back in action. I'd find a fifteen thirty game, and I would pound them. And you know, it, if I went broke, it would set me back a month. You know, right. and so what? So right, right, right. right. Yeah, it was, it's 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 very different mentality as a forty seven year old guy that has a bunch of uh, mouths, you know, to feed and that's that depend on me. Well, and then also that mentality could have helped you win that bracelet because it's kind of like For sure. ignorance is bliss, right? You don't know any better. Like you weren't nervous about not winning, right? Yeah, you, you know, it, literally if, no fear. Right. If, if you finished, you know, five, six, seven times in a row and got very close and you, and now you're playing, you're like, God, I just want to win. And I'm afraid to lose instead of I've got no fear. I'm, all I'm doing is trying to win this thing. And I don't really care. You know, like Ricky Bobby, if you're if you're not first, you're last. I mean, like, cares, yeah. right. It's either that um, or nothing. Luckily, right. Yeah. I mean, luckily, my competitive background, that's you know, I'm not smarter than anybody out there. I, I don't play each hand better than everybody out there, but I feel like I've basically been bred to be uh, a poker player playing under the lights in the high pressure situations mm -hmm. because I just don't feel stress and I don't, and I don't ever play, like you say, not to lose. Like I always play to win. Um, it, it, it hurts me a lot um i do stupid shit but um you know when when shit starts lining up in the stars and it makes me look good you know now where you know somewhere along the way you'll see the same mentality and make me look really bad right right, right. and i think i think that's the one thing a lot of people don't realize that they all go oh look He's not trying to lose. He goes for it. That's the way you have to play all the time. Yeah, but yeah. it's not always success. There are times where it goes the other way, right? Yeah, and, and it's, it's like dancing that fine line of insanity. I mean, it's right, like right. you can look really good, but when, when it's bad, we could be having this interview and you could be asking me, what the fuck were you thinking? And <laughs> right, I mean, right. a turn of a card and like 45% of the time, that's what our conversation would be about, right? Right. 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 Instead of instead of cashing 11 of 34 times, we could be talking yeah. about, wow, you went 0 for 25. Good for you. Right. <laughs> what yeah, a show. That's a record, by the way. Yeah. Good for you. <laughs> yeah, <it is> <laughs> uh, when we come back, we're going to talk more with the 2021 WSOP player of the year, Josh Arie, when we return here on the Bernard Lee Poker Show.